Good evening and greetings everyone from the Ecumenical Christian Center. This is the ninth lecture on ascent Buddhist Christian dialogue, what Father coined as ABCD. This is a series of lectures organized in a joint venture with Office for Ecumenism and Dialogue Catholic Bishops Conference of India CBCI and the Tibet House Cultural Center for His Holiness Dalai Lama New Delhi. So welcome everyone once again. And this evening we have two prominent speakers in our meet and Father Matthew will be moderating the session. Father Matthew is the director of Ecumenical Christian Center Whitefield. So without spending much time, I now hand over the time to Father Matthew, the moderator for this evening. Thank you uh, very much. Tang uh, Milun Wi-Fi, the Deputy Director of Ecumenical Christian Center. Milun um, is from Manipur and he has his uh, Masters in Theology from the Kotayam um, FFRRC and then uh, he is working as the Deputy Director at Ecumenical Christian Center. So Good evening to all of you, most welcome. And uh, we have uh, two wonderful speakers today. One is uh, Venerable uh, Doctor, uh, Venerable Bhikkhuni Dr. Dhamma Paripunna from Thailand. And uh, we have uh, uh, Reverend Father Roy uh, from Kerala. Um, Venerable Bhikkhuni Dhamma Paripunna, uh, since uh, in Thailand, one and a half hours is ahead of our time. It is already at eight o'clock, so therefore uh, it will be late. So uh, uh, Bhikkhuni Dhamma Paripunna will be giving the first lecture and uh, afterwards uh, Father Roy will be speaking. So uh, Father Roy is also belonging to the Jesuit congregation and I will introduce him um, after uh, the first lecture. Let me introduce um, Venerable Pikuni Dr. Dhamma Paripunna. Namaskar. Uh, I will introduce a little <laughs> more time, give me. Yeah, so Pikuni uh, Dhamma Paripunna is known as uh, Srirath uh, Chetsumon. And um, uh, it would be great to know that she has a PhD doctorate in farm management from the Lincoln University, New Zealand. So she was also a professor of human resources and community development um, in uh, Keset Sarat University, Nakhon Patom, Thailand. And ordained as a venerable uh, by Dharmananda, uh, as a novice in uh, uh, 2014 and 2019 at Watlavo International uh, Monastery, Bodhgaya, as an ordained uh, full monk. And uh, Bhikkhuni uh, Dhamma Paripunna is living in Nakhon uh, Patom, belonging to the member of the Bhikkhuni Sangha uh, Monastery in Nakhon Patom. Uh, Thailand. So over to you, uh, Venerable Pikuni Dhamma Paripunna. Good evening, everyone. Namaskara. You say this in India, right? Yes. To pay respect to all fathers. Well, it, my story is quite different from Venerable Dhamma Nanda because Venerable Dhamma Nanda my teacher, she has her background in philosophy and religion study, but my background is in farm management. That's why it's just like a big shift from um, agriculture. I had my first two degrees in agriculture from Kankan University in Northern Thailand. And then I did uh, my PhD in farm management. So I would start with uh, why I moved from farm management into Buddhism. 
it's very interesting because uh, I was bringing up in a religious family with my grandmother. She's go to temple that time, just normal. And uh, she took me to the temple with her. And then my mother as well. She also go to temples. And uh, so I'm familiar with going to temple just like you going to to church. So um, what what the turning point is that uh, when I start to work at the university as a professor, I was a work colleague before. Keep working hard, going to bed very late at night, and uh, wake up early in the morning. And then I just realized that this is not quite right, <laughs> the way of life, because we push too hard to ourselves. And I got sick, catch a cold all year round. I start to realize that this is, we need to, to look at something that harmony, in harmony, work life and uh, have some time for my families. So in 2010, my elder sister, she, she, she is a researcher and she, she told me that as a Buddhist, we should go to visit the four holy places of uh, Buddhism, the place that uh, Buddhists should visit in India, the place where the Buddha was born in Nepal, uh, enlightened and uh, first preaching and passing away. So still, we couldn't do that in 2010 because both of us were engaged with our work, too much work. Until December 12, no, not 12, December 31st, I do remember because it's the, the, the last day of that year. We decided that, okay, now it's time for us to do pilgrimage to this uh, holy four, four holy places. And we got on the plane. My sister sat on my left hand. I sat in the middle and another woman sat on my right hand. I noticed that she is a Mahayana monastic. But that time, I, I didn't know whether she's a bhikkhuni or novice. So I sat silently and observed this monastic, female monastic. And I started to think this way of life probably good because her appearance looked very peaceful and calm. Unlike our lay life, we keep working hard and very chaotic life as a professor. <laughs> so in that trip, we are really lucky, I think, because normally they, they, the tour wouldn't take us to the to Waishali. You know Waishali? Waishali is the yes. place where yes, where the where Queen Hapachapati, aunt and stepmother of the Buddhas, asking permission for ordination from the Buddha there. So when I arrived at the, the entrance at the gate, I walk along the road to the Udaka, the, the residence the, the, of the Buddha. And I stop in front and feeling, very strong feeling, it's a spontaneous feeling that I would like to be ordained and pursue my 
monastic life. So I made a wish and made my determination, asking permission to be ordained from the Buddha in front of his residence. That's very strange because there's no plan, nothing at all. Just like maybe what you call it, a call from God or from Buddha, I don't know. It's hard to tell. And uh, my sister told me that, no, there's no bhikkhuni in Thailand because we, we know nothing about ordination and the Theravada bhikkhuni in Thailand that time. And the one you saw on the plane uh, is Mahayana, bhikkhuni. And I said, it doesn't matter <laughs> as far as I can pursue a monastic life really calm and peaceful, that's enough for me. So when we, in that trip, came back to Thailand, it seems like everything just, I don't know, it's the, the way is path for me already. So in that year, 2013, I came back around June. A friend of mine asked me, would you mind helping me, a, a male monk, to do research? I was wondering why a monk need research. Still, I said, okay, I can. I'm willing to do so. So we went to the first meeting with the, the research team and the the month that brief about the scope of the research. And then in the next, next meeting, so everyone just uh, gather the name of the key informant because we need to collect the data from key informant. So in the second meeting, a piece of paper was distributed to me and I looked at that paper, and I saw the name of Venerable Bikuni Dhamma Ananta, Associate Professor Dr. Chasuman Kabilisi. It's just like God sent me to the monk, through that monk. So I asked my friend, could we interview this Bikuni so I can ask information about ordination from her? And then uh, we made appointment with Venerable Dhamma Nanda and uh, went to her for interview. And at the end of the interview, I asked her, I would like to, to be ordained. And she asked me my age that time and my career. And I said, uh, I'm a lecturer at Kasisa University. And she said, not now. I was wondering why, because I would like to be ordained, but why she say not now? And she said, but still, we do have temporary ordination for the nose in December and in April. So I said, okay, temporary ordination, better than not being. And I keep thinking, okay, I have the plan to be ordained. So still, I, I was engaged with uh, so much research work and uh, <clears throat> supervision until December 14, I, I clear all my, my burden and I think this is I should take my first ordination as a novice to experience the real monastic life. I came back to the monastery and then on December the 5th, that's the, the birthday anniversary of the King Rama the Nine, the past king. So I intend to, to offer my marriage 
from ordination to him. That time, the king was hospitalized, hospitalized and he's very sick. And the day after ordination, I went for arms brow throughout my entire life before that point. I offer food to, to the monk, put food in the arm bowls of the monk. And that morning, I was the one who baking, holding the arms, and then uh, people just offer food into my arms. I feel I'm, I was so familiar with this activity. I don't feel awkward or anything. So I came back to the temple and I told Venerable Damananta that I, I might have been do this thing before, but not in this life. <laughs> and that's a very strange because she also told me that, yes, just like myself, since I, she said, since she, since she had her head shaped, she had, had not seen her well, hair, head. And then one day she, she saw the mirror and she said, oh, I'm, I'm face so familiar with this face. So that's very good start that uh, I feel nine day after temporary ordination, I learned about the requirement for ordination, the process of ordination, and uh, everything that I need to know about the ordination. And the last day, when I had to disrobe, because that time I, I had four PhD students under my supervisor and four master students under my supervisors. So I need to, to disrobe. And it's very strange because when I need to, to say uh, the dis disrobing uh, words, I was crying. Just like I didn't want to, to disrobe. And uh, Abhikuni in this monastery just told me that your way is here, so come back later. That means I can come back and take ordination later. When I went back to the department, at that time I, I worked for the Department of Human Community Resource Development. In the first meeting of the department meeting, I announced that three years from now on, I will resign. Please find someone to replace my position. And I think two years, that's more than enough time for all my students to finish their study, to submit their thesis. And, and uh, in, in that year, 2013, when I decided to be ordained, it's just like a test that whether I would like to pursue worldly life or to, to, to shift to monastic life. Uh, the thesis of my PhD, one of my PhD students, was awarded quality thesis from the university. And I myself also was awarded outstanding researcher. It seems like the test, I mean, the test that, okay, if you want to cling on to this worldly life, you go for it. And not, if you're not, so just quit the job. So two years, I quit my job on December 2016. And I came to Verbeda Mananta for ordination. This is the second ordination as a novice. 
on April 6, which is also the birthday of the Venerable Grandma, uh, Mother of Venerable Damananta. So she asked me, how long are you going to stay? I said, on, I stay on, <laughs> on, <laughs> for good. And then I learned that because people sometimes they don't know exactly what what is the the ultimate goal of their life that that time i was so suffering because i worked so hard and work quick and i thought it might be a job that come to an end so that's why i came across the teaching the buddha and I learned that the Buddha, he found the truth, ultimate truth, that we born, we getting old, sick, and then death. And we keep recycling in this uh, birth and rebirth. So, I mean, if I can walk, According to the teaching of the Buddha, again, and cycling in the, the birth and rebirth again. And then I practice meditation since I was 45 as a lay people that time and continue on until up until now. And I learned that meditation is very, very good means to, to suppress the suffering and to end suffering by itself in the end. So we need to know that there's two, two kinds of meditation. The first one is Samatha. How to practice this uh, Samatha? That means you train your mind to be, to enter to the one-pointed state of mind, focusing on particular thing. And that's the suffering seems to not to, cannot do anything to you. And the other one is vipassana or insight meditation. When you see and get to the truth of the things and you accept it as it is, that's the, you don't need to suppress anything. And because you have the right view to suffering, so you can end the suffering for good. And uh, I would like to, to guide you the first one, the Samatha. Or concentration meditation because most of the time the mind of people just wandering around somewhere else very far very close whatever that's why people suffer because they think too much so once you don't once you know that the mind not only one thing at times you're just focusing on one thing and you need to train the mind slowly focus so may i ask all of you to close your eyes to yes uh, um venerable uh, pikuni uh, dr dhamma paripuna is asking us uh, she will give a meditation practice now and uh, asking us to close uh, our eyes and uh, be in the meditative pose. Over to... I will give guided meditation. Uh, yes, Bikuni. So once you close your eyes, you shut one door. And then, place your mind on top of your head. Just knowing it. The mind just like innocent child. Now, Move slowly 
to the face. Neck, chest, belly, bottom, hip joints, thighs, knees, chest, ankles, feet, and feet fingers. Just knowing it, each point that you place your mind clearly. Now, moving backward from our feet finger to the feet, ankles, chains, knees, thighs, hip joints, bottom, belly, chest, shoulder, upper arms, elbows, lower arms, hands, fingers, just knowing it clearly, moving backward from our feet finger, sorry, to the palm, just knowing it clearly, to the wrist, lower arms, elbows, upper arms, shoulder, neck, face, and to the top of your head. The mind still wandering, but just within this body. Now, move the mind from the top of your head to the tip of your nose. Press is gently at the point you can feel the touching of the breathing in and the breathing out clearly. Once you found that point, press the mind there gently. Take deep breathing in. You may follow the breathing. Long breathing out. You may follow it out. One more time, deep breathing in, long breathing out. Deep breathing in, long breathing out. Now, you don't need to worry about the length of the breath. The physical body is going to adjust. Just place your mind at the tip of your nose. Just like a kid sitting at the door frame, watching people entering into the room and out of the room without following them. Just you are observing the breathing in and the breathing out. Once your mind are full, you have any thought on the mind. You just stay with the air or the breathing. So breathing is just breathing without you. When you contemplate, the air in and the air out. It doesn't belong to you. You are not in that air. And that air is not yourself. Thank you.
Thank you uh, very much, uh, Venerable Pikuni Do Dr. Thamma Paripunna. So you have uh, given to us uh, your search for meaning and uh, how uh, you wanted to become a Bhikkhuni, moving uh, from uh, professorship, intellectual knowledge, to wisdom, meditation, and transformation. And uh, we are grateful to uh, you for this wonderful uh, lecture and as well as this uh, meditation. And um, you have shown us that you know how to be calm, uh, peaceful in times of crisis, frustration, and uh, also uh, disappointments and when we are lacking uh, things. So um, I don't go further uh, explaining about uh, here. We have uh, almost uh, 10 minutes. So who would like to interact uh, with uh, Venerable Bhikkhuni, please uh, either uh, there is the reaction box or you uh, raise your hands so that uh, I may be able to call you or you can ask questions. You also need to uh, unmute yourself when you need to ask questions. So please over to, uh, well, uh, to the screen, not, not to the floor. So Minlun, uh, please help me if anybody is uh, wanted to ask questions. Yes, Father. So, um, Bhikkhuni, I will ask the, maybe the, the first question that uh, since um, you were into farm management, your PhD, and then you were also doubting whether to uh, become, continue your professorship um, or uh, to become a Bhikkhuni. So what made you uh, the, the last, you know, to choice? You could, you could have have a worldly uh, life with full of uh, money, name and uh, power, and then uh, to withdraw from the world to meditation, silence, uh, and then wearing uh, a dress, you will be separated. So, so what was the, the point of attraction? Moving from uh, my worldly affairs to spiritual affairs. Could you please tell us? Yes. Well, as I told you, I have no interest in the worldly life because you climb up the, the ladder like a professorship. And in the end, you retire. And you also, some people need to work after retirement. And some people may not. And I think to myself, I think to me at that time, I got everything because I, I was very well planned when I start my job. I intend to have a residence and then saving money to travel. And uh, when I have everything, according to my plan, and I found it. there's nothing in there. Still, sometimes it gets sick. Sometimes we, we, we're not happy with the too much work. And uh, one thing that I think I better, better take this uh, honesty life, because I know that the teaching of Buddha lead us to the ultimate truth, undeniable. No matter how much we work hard, no matter how much money we earn, no matter how much good health we have now, at the end, you cannot take all this with you. Be still under the, the true nature of the nature. When we were born, we growing on sick and dead, keep cycling like this. And I want to stop this cycle, not to come back again. I saw my niece, younger niece and nephew, 
when they were born, they become a baby and then go to kindergarten school and then uh, primary school, secondary school, high school, university, and get married. <laughs> and then keep cycling again. So I don't see that's the, the thing that uh, can keep us happy. Happiness, I mean. So the happiness to me, that mean you, we need to have something that very peaceful here, tranquil here, and get into the truth here. Because we don't know the truth. That's my background in agriculture. When I understand the teaching of the Buddha clearly, when I contemplating on the body, he said, our body just like composition of four elements, or sometimes it's five elements. The first one is earth, and the water, or fluid, on the fine and the air element. So when I'm breathing in and out, I can see the cycle of oxygen and carbon dioxide because my background is in, in, in sign clearly. And I ask myself, where am I? The air in and the air out, the same air, and the composition of this body. So when I look at the water element, the water out there, when I drink inside, the water in here and out there, the same thing. We drink water and then become the fluid in our body. And then the fire element as well. When we drink, the digestive system keep working. So that's why keep out of the body warm. We're still alive. In the same fire out there. Where am I? <laughs> and the a, a, the, the solid part the bone, the muscle, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So when we eat food inside, and then when we die, it returns. Everything just returns to the same nature. The nature here and the nature there is the same nature. We just borrow from the nature, but the deluded mind mistaken it as the same. And even inside our body, there's a cavity in the ears, the mouth, the esophagus, the respiratory uh, system, all that, there's a space element. So when we die, we return the, the air element first, and then water element become protein. <laughs> and then, oh, sorry, fire element. Because yeah, I've been thank you, of, thank you, uh, Bikuni. I think uh, this is a great uh, explanation. And uh, yes. your meditation uh, was also appreciated by many. And uh, I, uh, there are many people who wanted to ask you uh, some cl uh, clarification or, yes. or questions. And uh, we have uh, Shirley. Shirley wanted to ask a question. Shirley? I'm sorry, Uncle. It, I pressed it by mistake. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Then... Um, um, yes, Reverend Sukumar. Yes, Father. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you very much, Bukuni, Dr. Dhamma, Paripurna. Uh, you did a fantastic job. It is very enlightening and enriching. Thank you so much with immense gratitude. We are all living in COVID-19 pandemic. It is not only a health crisis, but also human security crisis. We need vaccination not only to our health, but we need vaccination to our mind. Having said this, my question related with mindfulness. Recently, I'm learning conversations on dining table with our director, Professor Father Matthew Chandran Kunal regarding mindfulness, Vipassana Bhavana. How do you look at mindfulness <laughs> in the context of uh, Buddhism in Thailand and its implications in the present, con present context? Thank you. So the, the bhavana is like development of your spiritual development, right? 
And in this crisis, we can reject that the crisis there. But what we need to handle this is that how could we handle our mind with this uh, crisis? We know everyone is like suffering, frustrated, and uh, very chaotic. So when we are mindful, we tend to look at things as it is, and then we come back to stay with the very present moment. A courteous, but we're not panic because of this crisis. Some people, they got panic because they are not in the very present moment. They keep thinking, what can to happen? to their life. Some people lost their job and so many problems, economic problems all over the world. And what we can do, we need to come back to focus on this mind. This is very beautiful mind. We try to do whatever we can to reach our people with loving kindness. That's why our temple distribute food and learn food item to the community around. And people just ask us, don't you don't you scare of getting COVID-19? And we say no, because we are conscious and not panic. And we take the measure, preventive measure, and at the same time, we come back to look at our mind. And we fulfill compassion and loving on side, sharing, suffering. But we don't climb into that suffering. You know what I mean? We, we can share the suffering of people but we, we, we understand the, the truth, whether COVID-19 arrived or not, we die anyway, right? So how we prepare to handle this situation? And if you get it, it's okay, because you have to do your best to prevent. But if you don't get it, it's also okay. At least you help so many people out of hardship. That time they lost their job, they have no food or whatever. But most important is when you work for people, don't let your mind down. You know what I mean? Yes, be cheerful to help and come back and practice and develop the strength here so you can extend the strength of the mindfulness to other people. That's why some people come to our temple for meditation so they can, can, can learn to stabilize their mind in this very hard time or difficult time. Thank you very much, uh, Pikuni uh, Dhamma Paripurna. It's an excellent answer. And then you have gone deeper into this Vipassana and uh, uh, Samadhana and these various uh, means of uh, Buddhist meditative processes. Uh, maybe uh, I, I would like to request you that, you know, so uh, ECC is also planning to have um, a book edited on all these different lectures. So could you please write maybe around 10 to 15 pages on your transformation from um, management and uh, farm towards uh, meditative uh, processes of controlling yourself with the mindfulness. So that would be grateful. And in the name of uh, all, uh, I thank you, uh, Venerable Pikuni, Dr. Dhamma Paripunna, 
and we will be always in contact. And uh, I know that you were ordained in uh, Bodh Gaya. So always uh, welcome to India. And uh, whenever you come, you please uh, come to Bangalore. You have a place here. And then um, all of them are, most of them are interested in this interfaith dialogue meditation. So we are grateful. And as a symbol of our appreciation and congratulations to her for this wonderful lecture, let us raise our hands and wave. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, Venerable Dr. Pikuni Thamma uh, Paripunna. Thank, thank you. So now uh, we will uh, to the, the next uh, speaker. Um, he is uh, Reverend uh, Roy Matthew Totatil SJ. Uh, if I summarize uh, what uh, he is, he is an artist, he is also a writer, and uh, he is a thinker, and he paints. And um, I have a very close association with him. He was instrumental in bringing many of the artists uh, coming uh, from all over India to uh, Ecumenical Christian Center and to organize an art, not only once, twice art camp. And uh, he was one of the leader. And uh, he has also uh, an art uh, group known as CARP, maybe uh, uh, Father Roy could explain. Father Roy also belonging to the, the Jesuits and uh, he was the uh, yeah, superior of Lumen Jodis. But I think now he wanted to, uh, to write and to paint and uh, to think. So therefore he's moving away from that and then uh, dedicating himself. So his education class uh, uh, qualifications, he was uh, degrees in economics, you know, philosophy, theology, and all those things. But he has uh, uh, degrees from fine arts in Trivandrum, MA in folklore from uh, MS University, then MA in fine art from Canterbury Christchurch University. Uh, Father Roy has uh, exhibited his uh, paintings in many places in Kerala, Kannur, uh, Lutheran Church, uh, 2003 in Delhi, uh, 2006 Lumen Institute, Kochi, uh, Sydney Cooper Art Gallery, Canterbury, UK in 2008, Canterbury Art Fair, 2008 in England, 2008 St. Catherine Hospital Art Gallery, Unna, Germany, uh, then also Green Orange Art Gallery, Kochi, then uh, church art galleries in Munich, Göttingen, Frankfurt, Aachen in Germany. Also the famous Kerala Lelitakala Academy, Trichur, Embassy of Hungary, uh, New Delhi. Then there are many uh, such workshops. He has uh, uh, painting exhibitions he has uh, conducted. Then also conducted uh, many uh, workshops and um, yeah, he's also the editor of uh, Edith, a magazine, and conducting art appreciation course and art workshops, writing uh, columns and articles on art in various periodicals and publications, classes on art and uh, aesthetics, credits, articles, and features in dailies and periodicals in India and abroad, a study on Kerala church murals, Church mural tradition in national and international publications featured on All India Radio Kannur and also a program on Shalom uh, TV. And uh, Father uh, uh, Roy is, as I told you, belonging to the um, Society of Jesus or the, the Jesuits. Uh, his companions are also uh, here, the general, uh, the provincial of the uh, Asian uh, Jesuit Society, uh, Father Pateri is here. Uh, also, Father Sunny uh, Jacob, the counselor for education for the Asia, the novice master, uh, Father Rachens. And uh, yeah, I think uh, we have also many other uh, fathers, sisters, pastors, uh, intellectuals. Um, and we also have Father um, Cherian who is the uh, secretary of the uh, Catholic Bishops Conference of India Office of uh, Dialogue and Ecumenism. We also have uh, medical doctors and uh, others. 
So over to uh, uh, Father Joy, uh, speaking on art as a means of transcending suffering in this time. Thank you, Father Matthew. <clears throat> um, good evening to all. Uh, thank you, Father Matthew, for inviting me for this talk. In spite of the fact that artists are not good speakers very often. They are not men of words, but men of symbols and images. Anyway, I will try my best to share with you some of my reflections. Uh, we are in a special situation now, we all know. And we don't know when this pandemic will have an end. The atmosphere is filled with anxiety and fear. So in this background, I am trying to share with you some of my reflections on transcending, uh, how art can be means of transcending suffering. Recently, I heard uh, that one of the newspapers has given an argument that art is useless or nothing to do with this insecure time of pandemic. But all, at the same time, almost all the newspapers and online media have been giving reports of various individuals and groups who have engaged with the creative activities like uh, online art camps, exhibitions, music concerts, art challenges, online dance programs, etc. to overcome the negative feelings of the time and to make life more hopeful and relaxed in spite of all the odds. Suffering and pain becomes a source of energy for artistic creativity. And artistic creativity becomes a means for trans transcending suffering and pain. Let us examine this hypothesis. Uh, there was a particular installation artwork by one Mexican artist, Monica Mayer, in the last Kochi Mercedes Binale of 2018. The installation was a number of postcards clipped on strings against a board. I'll just share the image. I hope it is visible. Yes. Yeah. Um, the experiences of trauma, pain, and suffering were written on each of these postcards by women from all over the world who went through various trauma and suffering. This installation was an interactive art, and all were invited to take part in it by adding his or her own postcard with their personal experiences of suffering and pain. I was standing in front of this artwork and I noticed a young beautiful girl with her mother very curiously going through the cards. I could see various emotions on her face like anger, frustration as she kept on reading the cards and as a sudden she took up a, pl a playing card and wrote on it as if she was angry towards someone. As she placed it on the string along with the other cards, I noticed that her face became more relaxed and confident as if he ha she has done her revenge. So after they left the place with, the, with the curiosity, I read what she had written on the card. It was something like this. I was tormented and deeply wounded. The artist might have made this art installation out of her experiences of humiliation, pain, and suffering. She transcended her suffering into creativity, which might have liberated her. Those who took part in the installation work experienced the same like this particular girl which uh, I mentioned above. The artworks helped her to transcend her pain into a liberated freedom or enabled her to face it and move forward. 
the world is a mess of place. It is hurting and confused. Sometimes life doesn't make, uh, make sense. Sometimes there is just pain without explanation or reason. Human beings have been faced with this reality all through the human history. And the art was and is one of the means for trans transcending the miseries. The Paleolithic cavemen used to paint pictures of animals on their cave walls. They constantly were confronted by wild animals. By painting uh, the pictures of the animals, they were in fact conquering their own fear of the dangerous wild animals. Also, uh, they had the belief that by depicting a particular animal on the wall, it would be easy to conquer the animal in the actual hunting process. So the art of the cavemen worked as a means of transcending their fears and anxieties. The cowmen believed that the pitches had magical powers. Humans have consist consistently created art for purposes of magic to protect themselves from evil and harm, to express and control powerful emotions such as fear and anxiety. In almost all religions, including major and tribal religions, art combined with rituals are powerful means for transcending suffering and miseries. The images used in popular piety, ritual performances like Thayyam, Kalamedutha in Kerala are good examples for this. There are other examples also like mandala painting of Tibetan Buddhist um, monks. Spiritual powers are attributed to these art performances, which give healing and consolation to the devotees. This is Kalamedutha in Kerala. Also, the liberation mural paintings of Latin America were famous, depicting the aspirations of the people for liberation from the exploitation and socioeconomic inequalities they underwent for many years. They made these arts to empower themselves in their struggle for liberation and for overcoming their agonies of life. The liberation images and symbols they made in these murals were in a sense, a source of energy in the socio-political and theological liberation movements in the third world countries. In a similar way, Recently, we have seen that the image of George Floyd has been extensively used in the anti-racist protest by the black people in America. The image has become the symbol of suffering and the symbol of freedom and justice. Suffering of Christ was one of the favorite themes of many of the great artists. Enormous paintings have been made on this theme. Matthias Grunwald, a great German Renaissance artist, painted a picture of a crucified Christ, which is in a hospital chapel of the Eisenheim Monastery, now in France. In the center panel, the crucified body of Christ with black swords, which might have resembled those on the plague victims who visited the monastery in hope of a cure. The image of suffering Christ is a great symbol that the sufferings are not the end, but it is a way towards resurrection. The artist depicted the suffering of Christ as a symbol of the suffering of humanity. And it is a great symbol of great hope and consolation. Looking at Christ as a wounded healer, we are enabled to transcend our suffering into a great spiritual power. When words fail and we are numbed by what we see and experience, when all we can do is to cry, and then that is when art serves us best. It helps us to 
help us not to escape the pain but to transcend or overcome it it doesn't give us a reason for our suffering but it gives meaning to our lives james elkins an article that gives an account in his book pictures and tears of the people who have been moved by the great abstract artist rothko's painting and wept and there is a chapel in hudson in america with 40 14 big paintings of rothko this is not a typical religious chapel as such this rothko chapel is a place where one can experience an unusual mixture of spiritual and artistic purpose the comments in the visitors book of the chapel show deeper experiences of the visitors one have said something like this i can't help but leave this place with the tears in my eyes another person wrote like something like this thank you for creating a place for my heart to cry spending time in front of rothko's paintings are a kind of catharsis experience for the people who visited there with a heavy heart they find relief and peacefulness throughout art history art has been created that reflects transcendence both positive uplifting motives and pain and suffering great artists like michelangelo worked in both the human themes like the sistine chapel with the positive motives and his pieta embodiment of pain and suffering to a woman who asked if he was a mystic michelangelo replied not a mystic a prophet perhaps but i don't prophesy the woes to come i just paint the woes already there art is an effective means of communicating the experience of pain than words ever could the painful experiences goes beyond the actual occurrence of physical pain and surrounds the entirely of one's life the best of the art comes out of pain in one form or another pain is universal which is the reason why art breaks down barriers and brings people together art that is created out of pain resonates not only because we relate to pain but because we have an intense desire to be relieved from that very pain the famous uh, mexican artist frida kahlo is a good example of an artist who epitomizes an individual's strife and spirit to overcome challenges through creativity she suffered numerous injuries including a broken spinal column a broken collarbone and 11 fractures in her right leg throughout her life she had relapses of tremendous pain and fatigue which caused her to be hospitalized for long periods of time she had to undergo more than 30 operations in her lifetime frida kahlo taught herself to paint during her initial recuperation period through her art she reflected and transcended her sufferings and loss her paintings were a type of catharsis releasing sorrow and pain associated with her physical trauma uh, kahlo wrote like something like this i paint self portraits because i paint my own reality i paint what i need to painting completed my life i lost three children and painting substituted for all of this and she wrote in her diary i am not sick i am not i am broken but i am happy to be alive as long as i can paint as many artists have done instead of hiding her disability and traumas shamefully frida kahlo used her art as a way to bear her pain and tragedy through her many self portraits she was able to project her pain onto the canvas this enabled her to relieve herself from the burden of dealing with her agony 
the Norwegian artist Edward Munch's paintings, the screen, is one of the most famous painting of the all time. Sometimes also referred as the cry. Edward Munch reveals an honest and uh, reveals an honest and perhaps even ugly glimpse of his inner troubles and feelings of anxiety, illness, existential woes, and the untimely deaths of loved ones. All these caused him plumbed in the depths of his own anguish, using it was using it as source of material for his artwork. On this particular painting, he was explaining as this painting as the enormous infinite scream of nature. He was felt something like that. And this is the cry of the universe or the tormented human minds. And through this powerful painting, the artist transcend the anguish and suffering into a creative force, a masterpiece which reminds us of the human condition. Another most famous painting known worldwide for its expression of suffering and destruction is Pablo Picasso's Guernica, in which Pablo channeled the grief and anger he felt over the random bombing and virtual obliteration by the Nazis in 1937 of a small uh, Spanish village called Guernica. This painting so affected people worldwide that it has become one of the most anti-war paintings in history and a universal anti-war symbol. The way Gornica shows the tragedies of war and of the suffering it inflicts upon individuals, they gained a monumental status, becoming an embodiment of peace. The tragedy and suffering transcends into peace. It has become a perpetual reminder of the tragedies of war. And creating art and viewing art are therapeutic and healing. Apart from as decoration or placed in a museum, art can help us to be connected to our self-understanding, a search for meaning, self-empowerment and healing. Art chronicles and conveys a wide range of emotions from profound joy to deepest sorrow, from time to trauma. Throughout history, artists have used their art to explore human suffering, to find a meaning for their emotional struggles and to seek transcendence. Kathy a Mal Malkiori uh, therapist, art therapist, describes in her book on art therapy about the Saravaggio people who, despite the constant shelling and sniper fire in the early 1990s, continued to express themselves through art. They held concerts and in one point turned a destroyed theater into an exhibition space for art, created out of materials from the city's destruction. This illustrates that our try to express ourselves through art is a powerful and compelling human need and for transcending suffering. Art therapist Bruce Moon believes that art making serves an existential purpose, helping us make sense of a world that seems filled with boredom, dysfunctional relationships, abuse, addictions, and purposelessness. Art help people overcome their feelings of existential emptiness. Psychologist Rollo May observes that art can provide Transcendence allowing people to envision and imagine new possibilities through visual expression and to experience themselves in new ways. The contemporary cultures as well as pre-literate societies, art has been used symbolically to cure illness and bring, uh, bring about both physical and psychological relief. Humanities believe that art can be magic effect change or transform people and circumstances may be one reason why art has also been viewed as therapeutic. Art helps individuals as well as communities to reconstruct and to reorient themselves. 
And I conclude with the statement that art is what we do with our heart and art is necessarily spiritual. Thank you all and I conclude this talk. Thank you uh, very much, um, Reverend Father Roy. It was um, a passionate uh, lecture that was coming from your heart and it was and it is uh, also indeed a visual feast covering from uh, great uh, painters artists and also anecdotes from them and there were many questions so i don't want to uh, summarize it was uh, your lecture uh, was also philosophical and uh, coming out from your integrated uh, whole life as an artist as a priest and uh, as a faithful and uh, you have also shown how to transcend this suffering by various uh, means and uh, ways. So over to uh, the, uh, uh, the listeners. Um, those who would like to ask questions, please raise. I have also seen some of these uh, uh, in the chat. There were also a few questions, but I think that would be better if you ask directly. So over to uh, the friends. Yes, uh, Father Prasad Mathiachan. Unmute yourself and then ask the question. I think he... Uh, yes. uh, Father, thank you very much uh, for the very wonderful presentation. As Father Chandran Gunnel said, it is a, a passionate uh, presentation from your heart. So thank, thank you me. very much uh, for that passion to uh, something that you like. I have a very uh, two uh, simple questions. That is, first one is, uh, do you have any uh, artistic work uh, developed in this few months in connection with uh, COVID-19? Uh, if it is there, um, uh, how do you explain um, that uh, artistic work, that picture or uh, whatever that is, that uh, artifact? Number two is, is there a center uh, for artistic therapy in India? Uh, because um, you have said it is uh, art is therapeutic and I do believe in it. So do we have any center for that in India and where is it if it is there? Thank you. Yeah, thank you Father Prasad. Uh, for the first question, of course, um, I have uh, done a few paintings uh, in connection with the uh, COVID uh, um, uh, pandemic. Uh, as Father Matthew uh, said um, in the beginning, uh, we have a we have few artists uh, uh, came together and called ourselves as companions uh, of uh, a company of artists for radiance of peace, CARP. So we every month now. Uh, we conduct art workshops. Uh, now just finished one, uh, just finished three uh, art workshops. So I have done uh, painting on that. Uh, uh, I don't know how can I show you from these. Uh, uh, anyway, let me try to, to um, uh, trace it from my computer and show you if possible. Yes. Of course, the, the, the present situation is very disturbing and alarming. So of course, it's emotionally as artists, it affects us. Um, and we give expression to that, uh, um, uh, um, expressions to the feelings. I have done a particular painting based on the plight of the migrants. It was really, very really disturbing uh, seeing. Uh, so what um, as artists we could do is uh, paint it. Of course, we have shared it um, online and uh, many viewers are there. Uh, so we are going on uh, with art, uh, online art camps, uh, the, uh, the CARP group. And the second, uh, for the second questions, uh, so far I, I do not know any centers are there for uh, art therapy. Uh, art therapy courses are um, um, given in St. Xavier's College, Mumbai. Uh, and there is uh, uh, another private center in Bangalore um, uh, this is, that is, I'm not fully uh, know the details of that. Um, so they do art therapy workshops 
um, I mean, not only painting, but drama, theater, dance, and music, etc., combined. So only these things, I know. Uh, uh, see, the art therapy things are not familiar, much familiar to we people in India. It is extensively uh, done in, I mean, in, in the Western countries, in Europe, especially in England, uh, there are uh, plenty of places and there are professionals um, who do art therapy. And also for treatment, treatment of mental patients, it is a well-known um, uh, Sundays are there in the West. Uh, thank you, uh, Father Roy, for that uh, good uh, answer. And um, uh, to Prasad Achan's question, maybe uh, ECC, I think that we will be able to uh, make, you know, we have a few uh, art camps we already conducted. We also have uh, music, uh, dance, and uh, one of the, um, yeah, um, our uh, ECC uh, executive uh, program, executive Reverend Sugumar, he's a, a musician, and uh, maybe uh, we can uh, have something to plan at ECC. So probably we can do that. Then uh, to the next question, Desin. Desin wanted to ask a question. Could you please? Hi, Father Roy. Can you hear Hi. me? Yeah. I've got a problem with my connection over here. That's why I'm not switching on my video. Okay. I just have got a question. Uh, in the medieval ages, as we all know, most of our churches or like any other buildings that we have seen are uh, having a lot of artistic works. And uh, even in the churches, there were a lot of paintings inside the churches. And uh, we know that a uh, lot of uh, uh, people were facing a lot of difficulties during that time. And these artworks, uh, what I feel is it, give a, it gave them a kind of hope. It gave them a kind of optimism. Currently, in main, like in most of the modern churches or uh, modern buildings that we are having, uh, many of them are like bare. It is very plain. And uh, how do you uh, review this situation? Uh, is there need of more artworks in places of worship or in places of uh, common, uh, like maybe in common places itself? Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, of course, in, uh, from the early um, early history of the church, from the catacomb, catacomb onwards, um, the, the Christians were using art as a means for their um, prayer, uh, for their um, sharing of faiths, and it, it reached up to medieval period, I think. Also, during the Renaissance also, uh, of course, uh, the highest... Um, um, type of church art. Right? But in the modern um, period now, uh, according to me, most of the churches, especially in, in India, and uh, I witness here in Kerala, uh, it is not much of art, but more of um, decoration and uh, kind of uh, expression of uh, um, affluence uh, 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 and um, kind of showing off. You know? Uh, really, uh, that art um, doesn't, um, doesn't uh, do its purpose. So uh, there need to be a kind of uh, thorough evaluation or a, a kind of uh, um, a kind of um, art exposure to um, to us. You know what is what is really the purpose of art, and especially in in, in the holy places. You know? It is not just a kind of uh, decoration purpose, but uh, an artwork uh, in a special place like churches um, make that make that place holy. You no, know? uh, the, the the same um, uh, example from the cavemen. You no, know? they drew the artwork on the walls of the cave, and they found it as uh, something something magical. So. Uh, that's why we we bow before a uh, before the picture of Jesus or uh, Mary or in in all the religions, uh, the pictures or the statues are seen as holy, uh, embodied with the uh, spiritual power. Uh, so now, uh, as you said, uh, things are different. So we need to evaluate that. We need to have a kind of proper uh, aesthetic 
uh, artistic uh, awareness and conscientization. Uh, that is what I feel about it. Thank you, Father. Uh, thank you. Um, and then um, I, uh, uh, Matthew Cobb, um, he is also, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, early, thank you, Matthew. Um, he is from Canada and um, he is from, um, uh, yeah, he's also a dancer. And then I have seen his uh, dance with the, the native uh, people. So Matthew Cobb wanted to ask uh, a question. Please, Matthew. Uh, I shared a screen. Uh, did you see that screen uh, shot? I sent a pic of some uh, murals that we put. I yes, we have, seen, that. Yeah, we have seen that. You please ask the question. So that so you've seen the picture yes. I took of yeah. the, the church, everyone? Uh, I could Roy? see that. Uh, I could so, see that, yeah. Yeah, Roy, the, uh, then uh, Matthew, show it again. Okay. Uh, it uh, just a second. Uh, How is that? Uh, uh, there. Ah, okay. Okay, I see. Yeah. So you can uh, see three murals. Right, uh, yeah. The uh, that we. Uh, this is the side of uh, a church on a Native reserve, Native American reserve. Right. Um, uh, on the Canadian border. Um, and, uh, uh, and it is, uh, the cross was a simple red cross, just like the railing there. All right. Uh, yeah. and we took the cross down and re reimagined, uh, what the cross might look like, uh, within the culture of the Ojibwe people, which is the, the, the people I work with predominantly Native American and, uh, uh, can, can Canadian, um, Aboriginal. Uh, so that is a, a cross that they um, have uh, had in their culture for many, many generations. And we put, we re, we put that up on the side of the church. And you can see the floral design in the center with the sun uh, rising uh, behind the cross. So it really transformed uh, what was a simple red red cross uh, into something that was uh, in full flower or uh, transcendence or uh, freedom salvation resurrection the yeah. mural to the the mural on the right is a uh, is a uh, ogikwe which is a leader woman and she's holding the lightning bolt of knowledge and education and it's uh, going through the head of the serpent uh, the serpent, the black serpent, represents um, all things that are feared and people are uh, polluted by. So it could be drug addiction, alcoholism, but also uh, crude oil pipelines that run through native lands. And uh, and there's some other things. A great river there, the Mississippi River is a great river. And then uh, there's three different. Uh, uh, animal spirits or animals that are represented there that have no fear. The bison, the bear, the grizzly bear, and the mountain lion are the three, at least in North America, that do not have any fear. Yeah. Uh, of course, the, she's holding the child with a book in his hand. The book is green, the green book of nature, which uh, is a nod to indigenous uh, children. Uh, their, first, their first book of revelation being nature, creation and their devotion to a creator. Um, the final one that you can't see is another mural that we framed with cedar, which is an old uh, framing technique that uh, native people use in that area. And it shows all the different seasons of, of the five different seasons that the native people have. Fishing, um, berry picking, uh, syrup tapping, uh, and uh, hunting. So that's something that we did with art just by doing simple murals with on plywood uh, and putting them up on the side of the church for people to view. Uh, yeah. Matthew, so, any, any questions? To... So, so what you, uh, have you seen any um, churches uh, in your travels that have uh, taken art as a way of evangelizing?
uh, of really turning people's attention to uh, the Christ. Yeah, uh, thank you, Father uh, Matthew. Yes, um, uh, last February, uh, I was traveling through Gujarat, especially through the Warli tribal villages. Mm. Uh, I have seen the churches and uh, uh, prayer halls um, are decorated with the Warli paintings. It's a particular style of painting of the tribal people, Warli, uh, in, near Bombay. Uh, so, um, enormously they have used, uh, that is part of their culture, part of their thinking, part of their prayer. So the churches and schools, uh, all these art forms are used to educate um, children uh, for, uh, uh, for meditation, for um, pray, prayer purpose. So uh, they have enormously used the art forms for all the purposes, uh, um, of course, uh, for evangelization. So mm -hmm. as you have shown uh, uh, the murals, they also uh, have taken um, the stories from their culture, symbols from their culture, tribal culture, uh, and uh, a kind of um, um, transcending the Christian um, message uh, into their cultural artistic forms. So it will be so easy for them to grasp what it is, and mm. they will be so at ease with that. So yeah. it's a beautiful, um, the style is simple, but very powerful and beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, Matthew Cobb for this wonderful uh, question. And uh, Matthew Cobb is also an Anglican pastor. And uh, he also is a very good friend of the Jesuits. And I traveled with him from... Uh, Bangalore uh, to Calcutta, we visited together the house of uh, uh, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa and then moved to uh, Bhakti in uh, um, Jharkhand, uh, uh, that is in Ranchi, and uh, we met uh, Father Stan. So I still remember, and then uh, he was also to, I think, uh, to uh, Calcutta and then again to uh, Kohima for uh, the Hornbill Festival. And uh, so he, he's into this tribal culture and then how to identify more uh, to that. Maybe thank you, Matthew, uh, for this uh, wonderful question. And um, yes, anyone else? Father, may I also ask something? Yes, <laughs> please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Father Roy, for the wonderful presentations. And I really like your paintings. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, art, it can give a deep meanings. And then it can give uh, deep spiritual insights. But uh, as we all know, we are from different traditions. Some uh, Christian traditions are really against of, uh, I mean, the, the form of art. Uh, I mean, connecting with the, uh, I mean, idol worship or something. What, what, what uh, is your comment on it? Uh, yeah, uh, we know that uh, some of the uh, Christian sects, they don't uh, very much use uh, art forms. And uh, yeah, some of the some of the Orthodox churches, uh, um, even now, they don't use um, image, images as such. They use only uh, Byzantine icon paintings, uh, no other. So uh, that depends upon their uh, concept of, I mean, based on their theology or maybe a concept of uh, art uh, they grasped. So, uh, but at the same time, somehow uh, they, may be associated with some kind of art. Uh, I'm sure that uh, no one can live uh, on this earth without uh, any art. Maybe they have a music. Uh, art doesn't mean that only painting, but uh, uh, painting is one of the forms of fine arts. Music is there, dance is there, theater is there. So, uh, so I know uh, those uh, sects of um, uh, uh, church uh, group uh, who are uh, more giving more trust to music, uh, but not to visual arts. Mm -hmm. That difference is, but they are, they are, um, they have some kind of artistic um, um, association in their part of their um, 
uh, prayer or part of their um, religious um, rituals. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, it is now almost time. Um, let us uh, give a uh, applause or you know, wave our hands to Roy for the wonderful lecture. Yeah, yeah. It is splendid with all this uh, beautiful painting from all over the world, from the collective wisdom from the early uh, beginning of the humans painting and then, you know, connected with all this um, philosophical and uh, theological um, import and um, congratulations Roy and uh, thank, thank you, you very much for this wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, we will be uh, looking forward. Maybe you can um, write it this one as an article and then uh, we can have uh, as an edited work. So thank you for uh, all your uh, wonderful questions and the participation. We have all pastors, great intellectuals, sisters, uh, religious leaders, professors, all of them are here. So thank you once again to uh, all of you. And um, on uh, uh, 21st, we will have uh, another uh, series of lectures, two lectures on mindfulness, medical uh, doctors who are uh, also researchers into mindfulness, they will be speaking to us. And uh, we will be concluding uh, on 28th, we will have uh, some important leaders who will be presenting on that day. So that is on uh, next uh, two uh, th uh, Tuesdays, we will have at uh, 6.30 like this. So thank you uh, once thank again, you. Thank and you. Uh, yes, over to Minlun. Yeah, yeah. Once again, we thank Father Roy and Bikuni for the very insightful and so enriching presentations. Yeah, and thank you to all uh, who spared your valuable time to participate in these wonderful sessions. Thank you so much, and we look forward to meet you all again on twenty first. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew Cobb, early uh, morning getting up and uh, <laughs> asking questions <laughs> to see you after a long time. Hope uh, maybe you will be coming again uh, to India.